Hello, and welcome to Loyola Marymount University. My name is Dennis Draper, and I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration. Each year, we are fortunate to bring in a number of prominent business executives and special guest speakers to participate in our CBA lecture series. From high-ranking government officials, to leading journalists, to internationally acclaimed social entrepreneurs, all of our distinguished speakers share one common goal, to educate our students and local community on some of the biggest issues in global business today, all while reinforcing LMU's underlying mission of teaching business with ethics and social responsibility. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. It's a pleasure to be here and to see so many delightful people. I met some of you in a journalism class earlier today, which was a lot of fun for me. Um, we're going to talk about something besides journalism, though, tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to discuss the Madoff scandal in a, in a context where the focus is on ethics, not on money, not on celebrity, not on sensationalism, but on, on ethics. Just one caveat, though, before I start. I don't think my views on Ponzi schemes and business, eth business ethics differ sharply from those of the New York Times. But the opinions I express tonight are my own and not those of the papers. As you may know, I have spent the last three years learning everything I could about Bernie Madoff and his historic fraud, which was the largest Ponzi scheme in history. Now, for those of you who have been lucky enough not to have to learn what a Ponzi scheme was, a Ponzi scheme is an old, old crime. Uh, that was originally called robbing Peter to pay Paul, and the crime works just the way it sounds. Um, early investors chip their money into the pot, expecting that wonderful things are going to happen with it. Um, later investors come in, and based on those returns, they chip their money into the pot, and the Ponzi schemer does what? He uses the later people's money to pay those wonderful returns to the early people. So he is robbing Peter, his new investor, to pay Paul, his old investor. That's a Ponzi scheme. You know, I also like to say a Ponzi scheme is a liar with a bank account, but that assumes that you know what a Ponzi scheme is. It was, by any measure, the largest Ponzi scheme in history. His fraud erased $65 billion from the account statements of his trusting investors. Imagine going to bed one night, thinking that you had $2 million, $5 million, $14 million saved for retirement, saved for college tuition. By the time you went to bed the next day, it was gone. All of it was gone. There were thousands of people across this country and around the world who went to bed the night of Madoff's arrest with nothing but the cash in their wallet, a used car in the garage, and if they hadn't mortgaged the house to invest with Madoff, the house they lived in. That was all they had left. Now, those were paper profits, of course. That was money that Madoff had made for them with his little magic touch. The actual cash losses, that is, principal that people had handed to Bernie and never withdrawn from their accounts, totaled $18 billion. Now, just to give you a frame of reference, three weeks before Madoff was arrested, a colleague of mine at the Times had the honor of covering the largest Ponzi scheme in history, a lawyer named Mark Dreyer who had been arrested and was being arraigned the very week, in fact, the very day Madoff was arrested. Dreyer's Ponzi scheme sucked in the astounding sum of $550 million, the largest in history for three weeks, at which point the $18 billion cash Ponzi scheme, the $65 billion paper loss Ponzi scheme, cracked the headlines. It affected tens of thousands of victims up and down the economic ladder all around the world. At least two of those investors, devastated by their losses, committed suicide. 
when they learned that they'd lost everything. It was a devastating fraud by every measure, and it was the brainchild of this one man, Bernie Madoff. Why did he do it? Well, in my research, I learned that Madoff's father was a serial business failure, and his precarious finances created intense insecurities in the young Madoff family at a time when all of their neighbors were sharing in that great post-war suburban prosperity that gave rise to the baby boom. Maybe, just to play armchair psychologist, those insecurities, those anxieties, are at the root of Madoff's own nearly pathological refusal to admit failure at anything. Indeed, on my first of two interviews with him in prison, he refused to admit that his Ponzi scheme had failed. Well, he is in prison, Bernie. Um, no, no, he said he, he could have kept it going. There were still people who wanted to invest with him. Yeah, people throwing money at him. No, no, he didn't fail at his Ponzi scheme, he insisted. He just got tired of the constant tap dance of raising cash and dealing with investors and decided to quit. I also discovered an incident back in 1962 when the young Bernie Madoff, just starting out with his brokerage business, lost his client's money in a terrible short-term drop in the market. Now, he'd invested their money in highly speculative securities, the equivalent of tech bu bubble stocks of the day. The market hit an air pocket in May of 1962. We don't even remember it now, but in that day, it was the worst day in the stock market since the crash of 1929. So it was a big jolt for young brokers like Bernie Madoff, and he'd put his clients' money into all these win-issued stocks and the over-the-counter market, and they dropped like a stone. His investors lost, were virtually wiped out. So he used all his firm's capital to cover those losses, to stick that money into their account and hide the fact that they lost money, and he lied to them about it. So they continued to think that he was this market genius who had managed to navigate the worst week in the stock market since 1929 without losing one of their pennies. Even then, he found it easier to live with himself as a liar than to live with himself as a failure. As I said, his, Madoff's fraud was simply the largest and historic iteration of a very old crime, robbing Peter to pay Paul, what we now call a Ponzi scheme and what your generation may call a Madoff scheme. But you may not know about the remarkable camouflage that Madoff used to conceal his classic fraud for so long. He had computer programs that created the illusion that all of the stocks and bonds he was supposed to have were safely stored in Wall Street's central clearinghouse. And look, you could look right at his computer screen and see them there. This computer program created a bogus facsimile of the clearinghouse account statement, and all of the bonds and stocks were right there, safe and sound. He kept old letterhead stationery and an old Selectric typewriter, remember those? so that he could create realistic-looking backdated documents to satisfy regulators' questions. He swamped investors with tons of long, detailed account statements, producing enough paperwork to reassure them, but too much to tempt them to read it all. He told foreign accountants that he traded with U.S. banks, and he told U.S. regulators that he traded with foreign banks, knowing that the extra trouble involved in making those cross-border checks would likely deter further investigation, as unfortunately it did. I also learned that Madoff had a gift for seduction unlike any I have ever seen in a Ponzi schemer in real life or in history. One of the advantages of my job is I do get to meet rather more Ponzi schemers than you may. <laughs> At least I hope I get to meet more than you do. Um, and I usually know that they're Ponzi schemers by the time I meet them. I hope that happens to you, too. But the classic Ponzi personality is just what you would imagine, a charismatic bon vivant, 
uh, the guy over in the corner buying drinks for everybody and telling the funny stories, the guy who is very eager to persuade you that he's the smartest person in the room. That wasn't Bernie Madoff. Madoff was a quiet-spoken, low-key, self-deprecating guy who made you feel like you were the smartest person in the room. I saw this talent in action the first time I visited him in prison. I was strapped for time. I'd requested four hours. I got two. I'd done triage on my questions, trying to figure out how many I could squeeze in, but a little clock ticking in the back of my reporter brain every minute. And Madoff starts to digress to explain to me what an arcane investment strategy is, how it works. Well, I knew that. I, I didn't need to take up precious time to have him educate me about it. So I did the, you know, it's okay, I understand. Well, he leans over to his lawyer and smiles and said, it's such a pleasure to talk with someone so knowledgeable about the markets. <laughs> I mean, clearly. I was the most knowledgeable, professional, experienced, trustworthy reporter he'd ever met. I got to tell you, for a minute it felt great, <laughs> even though I already knew he was a swindler. I can imagine how potent his charm must have been when people still thought he was a genius. It was a remarkable form of emotional jujitsu. People who probably would have been instantly suspicious, instantly on their guard against the traditional Ponzi personality were totally blindsided by Madoff's quiet magnetism and laid back confidence. It was unimaginable to them that this respected, successful Wall Street statesman could possibly be a Ponzi schemer. We all know what Ponzi schemers are like, and they're not like Bernie Madoff. But let's not fool ourselves. Most likely, we would have fallen for him, too. Because as different as Madoff was from all the Ponzi schemers I've known in history, he shared one essential characteristic with them. He could make you trust him. He could make you believe that he was quite simply a wizard of Wall Street. Now, that's what so many smug skeptics um, uh, forget when they look at the Madoff scandal with 2020 hindsight and they say, oh, I would never have fallen for that guy. Those victims, they must have seen it coming. They should have gotten out of the way. Every successful Ponzi schemer, by definition, can persuade people to trust him. That's the one non-negotiable job requirement for a Ponzi schemer. Not that I want any of you putting out your resumes for that job. But if you do, being able to instill and inspire trust will be requirement number one. Think about it. That shifty guy you know, the one who cheats at golf, never picks up the tab, never pays the money he owes you, that guy may commit any number of crimes. He may cheat on his taxes or lie on his loan applications. He may take bribes or pay them to other people. He may pilfer company property or skim off company cash. But he will never, ever lure you into a Ponzi scheme, will he? No. Why? Because you don't trust him. And if you don't trust him, you're immune to his lure. So a con artist who cannot earn your unquestioning trust will soon be forced to go into another line of crime. Or as one fraud analyst said in a line that I wish I'd written, if it sounds too good to be true, you're dealing with an amateur. <laughs> and Madoff was a pro. So of course people trusted him. We would have trusted him too. But that's what makes the moral and ethical questions that surround the Madoff crime so interesting. He was a well-trusted wizard. And when we fall under the spell of trusted wizards like Madoff, we simply may not realize that we're taking an ethics quiz until we've failed it. Let's pause for a moment to think about all the wizards in our lives. Who are they? Well, they're the people who seem a lot like us, only better, 
far better, smarter, richer. They aced the test without studying. They perfect golf score, more successful, better dressed. Their chins don't sag. I don't know. All those ways in which they're better than us. Their mastery of their field is so astonishing that they truly seem to be operating far above the petty confusions that trip up the rest of us. And sometimes, sometimes the magic is real. We can all rattle off the names of nature's extraordinary exceptions. Einstein, Mozart, Thomas Edison, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, the great Wayne Gretzky of hockey, the young Tiger Woods in golf. These are people who play their game at a level the rest of us can only dream of, but it's real. That magic is real. Take it a step further. Add in all those lesser known but equally impressive wizards in your own lives. The people you know who are just so consistently successful at whatever they do that you always give them the benefit of a doubt and you never worry about taking what they say on faith. I could name some wizards in my own profession. Journalists who were given more than the usual amount of latitude by editors simply because they were so magically good at their craft. A few were frauds and fell into scandal. But most were the real deal and went on to greatness and deserved glory. Clearly, not all of life's wizards are Ponzi schemers. But all of life's Ponzi schemers are wizards at least in the eyes of their victims. They must be to succeed. And the great thing about being a wizard is nobody expects you to play by the same rule book that the rest of us do. Madoff benefited enormously from this perception that he was a market wizard. Regulators ignored warning signs that should have made them immediately suspicious of a lesser genius. Due diligence lawyers at major banks and senior accountants at CPA firms all around the world made exceptions for Madoff that they had never granted to other money managers. Institutional investors demanded less paperwork, less transparency, less cooperation from Madoff. That's how it is with wizards. People waive the rules for wizards all the time, and they never think that doing so is a breach of ethics. You don't have to bend the rules when you're a wizard. People will bend them for you. Consider the news accounts about MF Global, the commodities investment firm run by former New, York, New Jersey Governor John Corzine who had spent decades as an investment banker at Goldman Sachs before entering and then leaving politics. Now, it's been reported that the MF Global Board of Directors waved away the warnings of the firm's chief risk officer, who was alarmed about Corzine's portfolio choices. Now, Corzine, too, was a paid-up member of the Goldman Sachs wizard fraternity, a man who had earned the board's trust and admiration. So the directors made an exception for him. They overlooked the risk officer's warnings and trusted Corzine, and it destroyed their firm. Look back at any number of Wall Street and industry scandals, from Bering Brothers in Britain to Enron in Texas, and you'll see the same thing, the extraordinarily successful trader the star institutional salesman, that quantitative genius down on the derivatives desk. Oh, he was my favorite. The brilliant CFO. Wizards, every one of them. Wizards who could get away with almost anything because they were so dazzling and everyone trusted them so much. One of the very few funny jokes that the Wall Street joke machine, which can produce a joke about almost anything, produced about the Madoff scandal was that it proved once and for all that there was no such thing as a sophisticated investor. <laughs> After all, if hundreds, if not thousands, of sophisticated people 
lawyers, bankers, hedge fund managers, accountants, could utterly fail to save their clients or themselves from Bernie Madoff, who could claim to be sophisticated? Now, it's easy to dismiss those failures as lapses in judgment, which they certainly were. But I think they also could be looked at as lapses in character. Quite simply, these folks flunked an ethics quiz that they didn't realize they were taking. Oh, they'd have been on the alert if they'd been dealing with someone they thought would pressure them to cut corners. They'd have had their moral compass out on day one if they thought they were dealing with someone whose track record was a little shady, a little conflicted, a little mysterious, maybe a little offshore money, maybe a few Russians, who knows. They'd have been alert. But they weren't dealing with somebody like that. They were dealing with the highly respected wizard Bernie Madoff. They were operating in an environment built fundamentally and necessarily on trust. The Madoff story has persuaded me that everyone, from hedge fund geniuses to retired school teachers, simply every one of us, invests primarily as a leap of faith. That's what makes this fraud so terrifying. That's why I think we're so fascinated by the crime three years later, because we know if we're honest with ourselves that we decide who we trust for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with all the fine print that the regulators and lawyers and auditors think will keep us safe if only we would read every word of it, and we never will. You don't, I don't. Admit it at least to yourself. Why do we trust the people we trust? Think about it. Think of someone that you've met and trusted. Why did you decide to trust them? Well, I've asked people this, and here's what they told me. They were knowledgeable. They had a good track record. Other people that you admire trusted them. They observed all the rules that trustworthy people follow. They paid their bills on time. They didn't cheat at poker. They were punctual and disciplined and well-behaved and generous and didn't tell obvious lies. In short, we trust them because they seem a lot like Bernie Madoff before his arrest. Before his arrest, Bernie Madoff was, seemed immensely knowledgeable about his field. He was widely respected and admired and trusted by successful people. He never got drunk, he never flew off the handle, he paid his bills on time, he was generous to charity, he seemed honest and utterly devoted to his wife, Ruth. He would have passed our trustworthiness test with flying colors. But don't feel too dismayed about that. We're probably hardwired to trust each other. For most of us, that's our default position. When we meet someone, we are inclined to think that they are trustworthy until proven otherwise, especially if they look and sound a lot like us. Maybe only a little smarter, a little more successful. Some scientists think that an inclination to trust one another has some evolutionary advantage, and I can kind of see how that would work. You know, surely a tribe of cave dwellers who trust one another are going to fare better on the hunt, have more success with the woolly mammoth, than a tribe that's riddled with suspicion and mistrust and can't let any, each, each other out of their sight. So they probably starved and the, and the trusting tribe flourished. Of course, that suggests that the only sure vaccine against Ponzi schemes would be clinical paranoia. Ponzi schemes are impossible in a world utterly devoid of trust. But no one wants to live in a world like that. And modern commerce is utterly impossible in a world like that. How many of you went online this week to buy something from a place that you take on faith actually exists? You've never seen it, right? But you send it your money and you expect it to send you your sneakers or your book or whatever it was you ordered. Purely on faith. Subtract that faith. What have we got? So clearly, we can't fault the lawyers and the accountants and the hedge fund managers for trusting Bernie Madoff. And we can't simply degree, decree that nobody should trust anybody unless we want to bring human society and online commerce to a halt. 
The ethical dilemma at the heart of the Madoff case, one of them that I want to discuss with you tonight, is one we face every day. How do we monitor and police the people we trust? I guarantee you, you won't get in a lot of trouble trying to monitor and police the people you don't trust. You'll watch them like a hawk. It's the people you do trust who will be able to fool you. It is unethical as professionals to play favorites. So how do we keep our trust in someone from trumping our moral obligation to make sure that these trusted wizards play by the same rule book as the rest of us? Because this is the conflict of interest that we almost never recognize in ourselves or in others. But it is at the heart of this aspect of the Madoff dilemma. How do we keep our trust? in someone from rendering us incapable of objectively monitoring them. Well, there's a clue that's woven into the Madoff story. In my book, you'll meet a very wealthy retired businessman who wanted to invest with Madoff, but ultimately didn't. He didn't because he had a firm rule about how much he would entrust with a first-time money manager. No more than $250,000. That was it. And that was well below Madoff's minimum du jour. I frankly think he made those minimums up, depending on who was sitting across the desk. You know, this guy looked like $5 million, so he said it's $5 million. But the guy said, no, I don't do that. I, a, a quarter of a million dollars, and then if it works out well, then I'll do more. And Madoff said, well, you can put in $2.5 million now, but you have to put in the other $2.5 million by the end of the year. The guy, he wanted to invest. He, he angled six months to get this introduction, but he said no. Stood up, shook Madoff's hand, traded a few stories about the south of France, and went back to New Jersey. <coughs> Similarly, there was a charity out on Long Island in New York that was tempted to invest with Madoff. A lot of its donors did. They thought the world of him. They were making such good money with Madoff. And wouldn't it be wonderful if the charity's limited resources could grow that way, how much more good they'd be able to do. But it had a rule. It only invested with money managers who used an independent third-party custodian to hold the assets. And Madoff didn't. Well, they struggled. They debated, they had committee meetings, but ultimately they decided, no, we're not going to break that rule for Madoff. Now, did you notice? The charity and the businessman were spared not because they suspected Madoff was a crook. Far from it. They thought he was a genius like everybody else. They trusted him. But they had some sensible rules and they stuck to them even when they were sorely tempted to waive those rules for this wonderful wizard they trusted so much. The board of MF Global didn't have to be suspicious of former Governor Corzine. It simply had to follow the sensible rule that the chief risk officer's warnings should always be taken seriously. The board of Enron didn't need to be suspicious of its chief financial officer who went to jail. It just had to stick to the time-tested rule that immensely lucrative conflicts of interest, like those that existed at the top levels at Enron, are never, ever a good idea. They didn't need to be suspicious. They just needed to resist the temptation to waive society's rules for the people they had decided to trust. Trust, you see, is a two-edged sword. You can use it to climb your way to prosperity. And someone else can use it to stab you in the back. The magic spell that keeps you safe from that two-edged sword, the charm that can keep us from giving in to temptation to bend the rules for the trusted wizards in our lives is not suspicion. It's humility. We all make mistakes. We all have blind spots. 
We are all tempted to waive the rules for the wizards we admire and trust. And once we trust them, we simply will not see the red flags warning us that we're in danger. How many of you know that famous Harvard cognitive function test called the, the Invisible Gorilla? Anybody ever taken that little film clip? I'm going to spoil it for you now, so spoiler alert. In that test, test takers were uh, instructed to focus intently on counting the number of passes that the basketball team in white carried out in the course of this seven or eight minute film clip. And the more you caught, the better your score. So people were intently fo focused on that. They just, you know, wanted, to, wanted to do better than the guy next to them. At the end of the test, the test takers were asked, <clears throat> did you notice anything unusual during the game? Uh, did you notice, for example, the gorilla? A remarkable percentage would drop their jaw and ask, what gorilla? You're crazy. <laughs> You're crazy. If there had been a gorilla, I mean, I'd have seen it. How could there possibly have been a gorilla on a basketball court, and I would have missed it? But there had been a gorilla, a student in a full-body gorilla suit who walked out onto the court, beat her chest for dramatic effect, facing the camera, and then walked off. The whole thing took about six or seven seconds. The test takers who never saw the gorilla could not believe that they had missed her. After all, they saw her clear as day once they knew to look for her. The same cognitive failures are at work when police gather confident eyewitness testimony that turns out to be dead wrong. Indeed, a notable percentage of the death row cases that have been reversed because of DNA evidence originally rested on the testimony of a confident eyewitness who was absolutely certain that that was the guy, but who fingered an innocent man. All of us, even folks who take great pride in their skepticism and observational skills, maybe especially people who take great pride in their skepticism and observational skills, all of us have the capacity to miss what seems to be right below our noses. If we're not expecting it, if we're focused intently on something else, or if we have let our trust in someone else or in ourselves blur our vision. Our capacity for trust can create blind spots big enough to hide a fraud as big as Bernie Madoff's. And by definition, we never see our own blind spots until it's too late. That's why I don't cover uh, news stories about close friends or relatives. It would be a conflict of interest for me to do so. It would be unethical as a journalist for me to cover close friends or relatives. Why? No one would ever believe I could be objective about them. No one would ever believe I would hold them to the same rule book that I would someone I didn't know. So it would be an ethical conflict of interest for me to pretend to cover them. But it is just as much a conflict of interest to try to monitor faithfully the people we trust too much. Because that trust blurs our vision and produces our blind spots. So let's go back to those trusted accountants and other professionals who failed so spectacularly in the Madoff case. The regulators, the examiners, the auditors, the due diligence lawyers, the investment bankers, hedge fund managers, they all had high professional standards of conduct. They all had tough due diligence tests that they were trained to use. They all had best practices that had been drilled into them from the time they were sitting in seats like this. Best practices that set them apart from that poor guy on the street who gets tricked by some sidewalk con artist. They're better than that. But what they didn't have was enough humility to realize that their decision to trust Bernie Madoff might, just might, be a terrible mistake. They never considered that their decision conflicted with their professional obligations. In their pride, they trusted Madoff too much because they trusted themselves too much. Most of them were so convinced 
that they were right about Bernie Madoff, that they never even considered the possibility that this Wall Street statesman was a crook. Even worse, a few of them actually did wonder if Madoff was maybe a little crooked. They suspected he might be committing a form of insider trading called front running. There's no quiz on that later, don't worry. But it's a technical violation in which he would earn quick profits for them by using his knowledge of the orders flowing through his legitimate brokerage firm. But even those few who suspected that Madoff was kind of a criminal were confident that he wasn't that kind of criminal. And because they had so much faith in their judgment, they failed to see that their trust in Madoff posed a serious conflict of interest to their work monitoring Madoff. That's when we lose our moral compass, when we think our own judgment will always be true north. If those professionals had simply adhered to their own principles as faithfully and humbly as that businessman and that charity did, they'd have realized, you know, I might be wrong about Madoff, so maybe just for safety's sake, I should insist that he comply with the rules. Maybe just in case I'm wrong, I shouldn't bend the rules for him too much. And if they'd insisted that he comply by the rules, he would have refused. Surely he would have refused. He would have had to. And they would have sadly but firmly walked out of harm's way without ever realizing what a close call they had. Of course, not everyone thought Bernie Madoff was a fabulous Wall Street wizard, or at worst, a guy who maybe bent the rules a little bit to earn them a nice, steady profit. There were some people who thought all along that Madoff was a con artist running a gigantic swindle. And that brings us to the second ethical knot we need to unravel in the aftermath of this epic crime. If we learn nothing else from the Madoff story, we learn that there is no Wall Street honor code. There is no ironclad commitment to neither lie, cheat, or steal, nor tolerate those who do. Oh, there are thousands of decent, law-abiding, ethical people on Wall Street who would never, ever lie, cheat, or steal. Never. What about tolerating those who do? That's the rub, isn't it? After Madoff's arrest, a small army of hedge fund managers and private bankers and industry consultants came forward to claim that they'd seen through Madoff all along. They'd never fallen for that act. They'd, they'd twigged to him right away, and they kept their clients out of trouble. Well, can you imagine how differently this story would have turned out if all those brilliant folks who came forward after Madoff's arrest had shared their doubts with the SEC and the FBI before Madoff's arrest. But they didn't. They just quietly escorted their clients to safety and waited for the roof to crash in on someone else's clients. So here's a post-Madoff question I think we all need to wrestle with, especially those of you looking for a career in business. Are we our brother's keeper? when our brother is wandering around Wall Street. What is it about the Wall Street world that caused so many smart, knowledgeable people to keep silent for so long about Madoff, about the rising risk of mortgage securities, about predatory loans and sloppy foreclosure filings and dubious underwriting standards? What is it about the broader world of business that makes people so reluctant to report wrongdoing when they see it, and so quick to look down on those who do. And is there any way to change that? In the aftermath of the Madoff scandal, the SEC overhauled its entire machinery for dealing with whistleblowers. The new system even gets high marks from veteran whistleblower Harry Markopolo. So you remember, he is that quirky Boston quantitative analyst who tried so many times to alert the SEC to his suspicions about Bernie Madoff. But he failed. He couldn't persuade them that there was something fishy there. Well, even Harry thinks that this new whistleblower program is the cat's meow. He thinks it's terrific. The new system doesn't rely on some sort of honor code, of course. It relies on a whistleblower's greed. 
It offers cash incentives in the form of a share of the penalties that the SEC ultimately collects in exchange for timely, useful information. Now, this may encourage more people to blow the whistle on corporate wrongdoing. Indeed, I'm sure we all hope it does. But it will do nothing, I promise you, to improve the image of whistleblowers in the business community. Indeed, it will likely compound the image problem, which is pretty bad already. How bad? Look at all the synonyms we already have for those who report wrongdoing when they see it. Snitch, tattletale, turncoat, stool pigeon, rat. The nicest one in the modern thesaurus is informer, but you've got to say it with a sneer. Informer. Consider the bizarre accounting scandal recently unveiled at the Olympus Corporation in Japan, where long ago investment losses were covered up year after year by successive generations of accountants and executives. One of the most remarkable aspects of that scandal is that the stool pigeon, in that case, was the company's CEO, and even he got fired. He got fired for blowing the whistle. We may have thought it was his duty to report wrongdoing to his board of directors, but they thought his duty was to keep silent and preserve the corporation's reputation in the marketplace. Perhaps you heard the story about the security guard of the Swiss bank who back in 1997 discovered that stacks of old account ledgers were being shredded by the bank shredded by employees in the night. He secretly salvaged what he could and he turned them over to a group pursuing Holocaust era property claims against the bank. His actions helped the claimants win a substantial settlement from the bank. But do you know what happened to him? He became the first citizen from Switzerland in history to be granted political asylum in the US. His life in Switzerland had become a terrifying nightmare of threats against him and his family, some official ones and some anonymous ones from his, his fellow citizens. He fled, believing that the U.S. would at least be safer and maybe marginally more tolerant toward a whistleblower. And it is. Scorned though they may be here, whistleblowers in the U.S. are not quite the total pariahs that they are in many other countries. But it's still not a career move you're dreaming of making, right? So the Madoff case forces us to ask ourselves, why is it that society almost universally condemns the very behavior that could have shut down the Madoff crime long before it cost tens of thousands of people their life savings, long before it cost at least two despondent people their lives. You've probably heard that in prison, Bernie Madoff is admired by his fellow prisoners <clears throat> as a stand-up guy for not having fingered any of his accomplices. At his plea hearing, he actually perjured himself by swearing that he acted alone. Madoff lied, what a surprise. <laughs> he swore he acted alone, even though his right-hand man was negotiating with prosecutors at that very minute to plead guilty. And four other people have already pleaded guilty to helping him in this crime he committed all by himself. To inmates, blowing the whistle is definitely not an act of honor and integrity. In prison, an honorable man is one who keeps quiet about the wrongdoing he sees. Is corporate America any more enlightened than those prisoners? Let's play a thought game. You're the CFO of an upstanding ethical company with no skeletons in your closet. You're proud of your fiscal controls and, the, uh, and have certain of your team's integrity. And you found absolutely outstanding candidate to be your senior deputy. 
And then you discover that this person, years ago, once blew the whistle on an accounting firm, she, uh, on, an, on an accounting fraud that she had discovered at a prior company. Will you still hire her? If so, will her fellow executives trust her? Or will you be inclined to keep quiet about that little step in her career path just in case somebody takes it the wrong way? Here on campus, do you feel an obligation to report those who cheat, steal, or lie? Or do you feel a stronger obligation to keep quiet, to be a team player, to be loyal to your fraternity brother or your sorority sister? to protect the institution's research funding and its reputation by looking the other way in the lab or in the accounting books. And if you did speak up, how do you think you would be treated? These are difficult ethical questions, and the Madoff case reminds us with painful clarity of how much may be hanging on how we answer them. If we continue to believe that we can trust our gut about who is honest and ignore the conflicts that that creates, and if we continue to scorn those who blow the whistle on those who are dishonest, in short, if we keep doing what we've always done, then we're going to keep getting what we've always gotten. We're going to keep getting a world in which the next Bernie Madoff will feel right at home. Thank you very much. As you wrestle with your answers to these questions, I hope you'll consider this warning from the final pages of The Wizard of Lies. In a world of lies, the most dangerous ones are those that we tell ourselves. Thank you again. I appreciate your time. We are going to take questions. I believe Ross is going to return to the stage. Well, I'm just going to <clears throat> ask you if you have questions. We have two microphones. Since we are recording this for television, if you'll go to one of these two microphones to ask your questions. We're only going to have time for a little, uh, maybe two or three. But if you have a question, please go to the microphone. Ah, now we have microphones. Okay. Yes, sir. Could you, could you please give us your attention? Thank you. We have a... Uh, oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Peter Smithring. I'm a professor here at uh, the College of Business and the Management Department. Um, and one of the areas that I spend some time fooling around with is trust and, and I have three reactions to, I haven't read the book, so I, um, I'm, I'm reacting to what you said this evening as opposed to what may well be in the book. Um, the first is the part of trust that, uh, for example, I was uh, in New York City in the aftermath of the Knapp Commission investigation of corruption in the New York City Police Department. One of the reasons it was so systemic is that everybody trusted everybody else not to say anything. Um, that is to say, trust has a dark side to it. It's a two-edged sword. It is. Um, the second was that you, you talked about interpersonal trust. And Lynn Zucker, who's up the road at UCLA, talks about the relationship between interpersonal trust and institutional trust. And, and when you can rely more on interpersonal trust because in back of you there are institutions that buttress that reliance. It seems to me that you talked about the interpersonal trust, but the institutional trust in this case, my view, was the assumption that markets are self-regulating. That is, markets as an institution will, in fact, unearth the Bernie Madoffs of the world if they're wizards and liars. And so I can trust him because even if I'm wrong, there is this thing out there 
called the market, which will unearth oh. him eventually. Okay, I, I, I don't, I, we, we obviously have a lot to talk about, and I would love to explore these points with you at, gr at greater length. I hope you will stay and give me a chance to talk with you about it. There may be other people who have individual questions that they want to, want to uh, pose, but you're, you, the point you make about the faith we have in regulation is one that's particularly troubling to me because investor protection has dropped completely out of the political conversation. I watched all the debates. Someone had to, right? I watched all the debates <laughs> and I listened for any mention of what are you going to do to improve investor protection? What, what are you going to do to help make my retirement savings? Not a word. I heard promises to repeal Dodd-Frank, and I even heard promises to repeal Sardbanks Oxley, the law that was passed after the Enron scandal. I didn't hear anybody saying, oh, and we're really going to have a first-rate, crackerjack regulatory machinery. And I haven't heard anybody asking them that question even. I've never seen financial amnesia set in so quickly in America. I mean, normally it takes five to ten years to forget a crash like 2008 where we thought the ATMs were going to go dark tomorrow. So I, I am astonished, just as a, you know, as a neutral observer sitting on the sidelines, I'm astonished that that conversation has stopped, that no one's saying, you know, we need a smart, well-funded, professional regulatory agency to keep our markets honest. Instead, everyone seems to think that deregulation will be the cure for all of our ills today. And, you know, in what parallel universe did that happen? You know, I, I live in the universe where excessive financial deregulation nearly brought the economy to its knees, and you live there too, don't you? So these are really important questions. They weren't what I focused on today, but they are things that I've written and talked about. Um, you'll find some of them on, the, on my website, dianabhenriquez.com, where, where I've done other Q&As that focus more intently on that regulatory question. But it's a, it, that's a very good and a very important one. Um, are there other questions that people want to? I have one, and I, I'd love to ask. Yes. And that's, uh, I've been curious about the obligations of the accountants for the feeder funds ah. that fed these gigantic sums of money into Madoff. Can you speak to that? Um, yes, um, and and I wish it were better news. Um, the accountants are probably not going to be held accountable um, for that. Um, and you know, to some extent, I'm a little bit sympathetic because of, for them. The, litig the rules of litigation, securities litigation in this country have been changed in some really interesting ways that affect this question. It has become very difficult since tort reform in 1996 and that affected federal securities lawsuits it's become very difficult to file a class action lawsuit against a third party. I mean, you can sue Bernie Madoff if you want. The courts will let you do that. Good luck with it. Um, but the trustee in bankruptcy has attempted to sue three major global banks that provided banking services, one of them who provided banking services to Bernie Madoff, J.P. Morgan Chase. Those, those lawsuits have been thrown out of court at the district court level in New York. That's being appealed to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, but if it isn't overturned at that level, then those banks are not going to be within the ambit of the bankruptcy trustees' lawsuits. And the same applies to efforts to sue Pricewaterhouse, uh, KPNG, and uh, Ernst, I, I don't think Ernst & Young was among the big, um, uh, the big accounts. Basically, those were the two firms that handled a big number of the feeder funds. Those lawsuits are not being successful. They are being thrown out on technical grounds before it reaches the merits of the case. So I'm not optimistic that there's ever going to be a day in court at which we're going to learn what the accountants knew and when they knew it and what they should have done with what they knew. So I, as I said, I wish it were, it were better news. The Madoff case is going to rewrite law in several, uh, in, in several ways. It's going to rewrite uh, accountability for third parties, it's going to rewrite bankruptcy law in some important ways, it's going to rewrite how Ponzi schemes are liquidated and how their victims are compensated. So it's, it, that's one of the areas where, um, where it's been very troublesome and not very satisfying to 
people who want to see some accountability. Are there other questions? I think you need to come up to the microphone. I would love it if you would do, if you would do that. Yes. Hi, my name is Yusuf. I'm a business student here. And uh, just addressing the issue that you stated regarding the SEC and their changes of uh, policy towards whistleblowers. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that whistleblowers uh, are offered incentives based on the percentage of the damages awarded. Yes. Now, addressing an ethical issue, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, an implementation of such a system offer an unethical option towards a whistleblower to uh, hold off blowing the whistle because the longer they wait, the bigger the damages may be. So that's my question. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> it's not one that didn't occur to the regulators. Another potentially perverse incentive, of course, would be to not report what you find to your own management who may not know about it so that it will continue and you can get the benefit for reporting it. Some tweaks in the whistleblower law have been uh, developed to try to address that. Um, Corporate America wanted to write that rule to require you to go first to your bosses uh, when you learned it and report it to them. The SEC wouldn't buy that. They said, why should we, you know, suppose the boss is the guy running the fraud. Why on earth would should we require our whistleblower to alert him so we can start shredding documents tonight? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So they're trying to wrestle with that through scrupulous in investigation of the evidence that the whistleblower brings to them. The, the whistleblower is at risk if the SEC investigation, you know, all he brings them is a tip, they then will do. They'll get their subpoenas out and they'll do a full-scale investigation. And if that investigation shows that their whistleblower was in a position to have known about this seven years ago, he's not going to get his share. He may, in fact, find himself sued as complicit in the crime. So they have that, that enforcement hammer that they can use to try to counteract that incentive. But you put your finger on a, on a weakness in a lot of whistleblower programs. You're absolutely right.